Mini episode 734 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everybody. Welcome to FDH Lounge, mini-episode number 734. We've got FDH managing partner Rick Morris with you today, along with a very special guest. We've been really looking forward to this conversation. We have an author who has been a part of uh, preparing well, 38 books, either authored or co-authored, and 25,000-plus uh, articles about baseball, and much of that history, including a lot of it, from his time as a beat writer, drawn for the new book, When the Braves Rule the Diamond, 14 Flags Over Atlanta, a book that chronicles the long history of the Atlanta Braves and their period of success, the greatest period of success that the team enjoyed, of course, after their move to Atlanta in the late 1960s, the time period that, quite frankly, probably most people associate with the franchise. It's one of the more remarkable periods in the history of baseball as far as what this team did. And it's, it's unique in so many different ways because there's a lot of success to it. It's not always popularly thought of that way nationally, and it's a complicated picture. And it's one that, again, you can only navigate with somebody the quality of this author, the gentleman who wrote this book, Dan Schlossberg, author of When the Braves Ruled the Diamond, 14 Flags over Atlanta. Dan, welcome to the FDH Lounge. Sir, pleasure to have you on. How are you today? I'm doing great, Rick. Thanks nice to be on your show. It's uh, great to have you here. And, uh, again, this book was just very, very fascinating as far as how you went through, how you broke it down. There are a lot of different uh, aspects of that time period that you went into. Of course, you looked at uh, the, the major players, and there were many of them, so that takes up a good part of the book. You went through and you examined year by year how the, the, the team went because, again, there were high points and low points within – that history, some years of greater success, none bigger than 1995, the Seoul World Series championship of the run, but a couple of pennants mixed in between, a couple of first-round exits once the uh, uh, NLDS was introduced in 1995, a couple times of uh, making it to the National League Championship Series, but uh, being eliminated there. So it was an, an, a really, really interesting and mixed bag throughout those 14 flags. I know this is the 25th anniversary of the 1991 team that started it all. But beyond that, what was the impetus for you gathering up all of your notes and putting this together? Well, Rick, I'm a huge Braves fan. I have been ever since 1957. I live in the New York metro area, and 57 was a watershed year here because the Brooklyn Dodgers and New York Giants are going to California. All my friends rooted for the Yankees, but the Milwaukee Braves beat them in the World Series. And so I figured they were the best team. I've been with them ever since. So that was a big turning point for me to become a Braves fan. I've been a Rabbit fan ever since then. Well, I, uh, I was very privileged to be able to, uh, in the years before he passed away, get an autograph from Warren Spahn. I treasure it greatly. I got an autograph picture from him, certainly one of the, the greats of all time. And uh, that, that, that was somebody that had to provide you uh, through, with a lot of thrills through your life. Very, very much so. Here's my favorite picture of all time. Uh, Phil Negro was a very close second. Another Indian, by the way, Phil Necro. Mm -hmm. But Warren Spahn, I went to the Braves fantasy camp once when he was there, and I remember sitting on the bench and hearing him tell his stories. It was just fabulous. And also at the 99 All-Star Game at Fenway Park, he and Juan Marichal were talking because they were both on the team of the century, and they were talking about that 16-inning duel that Willie Mays ended with the home run. It was a one nothing game, and both Spahn and Marichal pitched over 200 pitches that night. I remember that 99 All-Star game uh, still. I'm sure there were a lot of great all -Star, great stories getting exchanged around the park that day. I think I still got it on tape somewhere when they did that. That was so awesome how they brought out the legends, and everyone remembers the Ted Williams part, of course, but uh, as you correctly point out, so many of them were there at that point in time, and unfortunately a lot of the great ones have passed since then, but as far as some of the, the modern legends of baseball, characters of baseball, what have you, these Braves teams and company, uh, encompassed a lot of people who the public has a fairly fixed kind of notion in their mind of, whether it be 
John Smoltz, superstar, who's a very, very solid guy, whether it be the outrageousness and the flamboyance of John Rocker. So as you were going about this, and again, you'd had this inside access all these years covering the team up close, what were you thinking as far as trying to make sure that you had uh, as much of a three-dimensional portrait painted of these people as possible, given that so many of them have a fixed image in the public mind? Well, the main thing was to make sure that the award winners got a lot of space. Well, by award winners, the six Cy Young Awards that the Braves won during that 14-year streak, the two MVP awards won by Terry Pendleton and Chipper Jones, the Rookie of the Year Award won by Raphael Furcal, and all the all-star citations and special achievements that they did during this time. The Braves teams won over 100 games six times, including a record-tying three in a row. So their excellence over 162 games, I would have to think, has got to be the team equivalent of Cal Ripken's consecutive games playing streak. You can make a very, very good case for that, uh, to be sure. And when you look at all of the accolades, that the team racked up in the, in, the, uh, in the course of just those 14 years, whether it be the individual ones, whether it be the team ones. What's very interesting is when, when people look at Bobby Cox and try to assess his place in baseball history, it seems to be kind of complicated because he is somebody who was judged to be ultimately a Hall of Fame caliber manager, so there's that. But there's also the sense among a lot of people, too, uh, that uh, perhaps he doesn't get the credit that he deserves given the amount of talent that he had at his disposal, given the fact that 13 times out of 14 they lost the last game of the season. Do you kind of subscribe to the notion that he probably doesn't get enough credit for what he did in those 14 years and, frankly, on either side of that as well? Yeah, I, I really do, Rick, because I don't like the playoff system the way it's set up. I don't like the wild card, and I hate the second wild card because it really increases the odds that the best team won't be in the World Series. For example, 2014, which is fairly recent history, you had two non-championship teams in a World Series. To me, that's a travesty. That's an insult to the integrity of baseball. In the old days, you know, people compare the Braves and their 14 straight titles to the Yankees winning five straight World Series, but the Yankees had no playoffs to worry about. Had they had the playoff system then that they do now, I bet they wouldn't have won those five straight World Series or even gotten there that often. Well, I have to laugh because in hearing you say that, my, my best friend is a Pirate fan, and nobody is cursing the one-game playoff more than him uh, these past couple of years, although, quite frankly, I don't think the Pirates are going to have to worry about getting knocked out of a one-game playoff in 2016 the way things are looking. But, yeah, that's uh, your, your sentiment is one that a lot of people have in different places about the way that they've structured it. And when you're looking at the – the job of coaching and managing the guys on the field there, going to the legendary pitching coach, Leo Mazzoni, the great job that he did with the pitchers over a period of time. Very interesting that he's a guy where you would have thought that once he moved on from there that some of the success would have followed. And, again, it doesn't seem like he's particularly desperate for a job in the last couple of years here. So what is it about that place and that time that brought out him being – you could argue at that point in time, maybe the greatest pitching coach of all time, if you just look at him at his best in that moment, and why it hasn't been able to be replicated subsequently. Well, Bobby Cox really let Leo run with the horses. He just told Leo, you take care of your pitchers, you get them out there, you keep them healthy. And he did, and proof of pudding is that trio of Smoltz, Maddox, and Glavin, they're the only trio of starters who are together for a decade or more to reach the Hall of Fame. That's, they're the only ones in the history of baseball, and that is pretty remarkable. And you look at the injuries or the lack of injuries the Braves had with Mazzoni's theory of throwing twice between starts. His theory was to throw more often and just hurt less often. And apparently it worked. Yeah, and it really goes against the grain of the modern thinking. So I can see where uh, a lot of teams might be wary of committing to something like that and feel that it might be kind of risky. That's an excellent point about his approach because uh, it really did go against the grain, but it brought out the best in everyone that was there. And uh, a question that comes to mind particularly as we're having this conversation uh, in the wake of, again, with people talking about chemistry issues and whatnot with uh, Kevin Durant now going to Golden State, you look at these big movements of a superstar joining a team having to fit in. When you've got a Greg Maddox joining a staff that was already great without him, and again, it just seemed like it was a seamless fit. It looked from the outside like those guys got along great. There was all these stories about the staff going golfing together uh, on the off days. So what was it like for them trying to incorporate somebody who was already great in his own right into a unit that was maybe the best in baseball already? Well, obviously, you're talking about the Greg Maddox signing after the 1992 season. Yeah, Ted Turner, the owner, then said to his guys, 
uh, I've got one bullet to fire, and you can either sign Maddox or you can sign Barry Bonds. And there was a big debate in the front office which one they were going to sign. And I really think they made the right move. Although at the time, I'm, I'm thinking that Glavin is the number one pitcher, and he's really going to be demoted to number two with Maddox there. But he took it in stride. Glavin's not that type of guy. He's a real team guy. And those three pitchers, as you said, you know, they went to play golf all the time. They exchanged secrets for each other's secrets. They made each other better. And that's why they all won at least one signing award during that streak. Exactly. I mean, that's always kind of stuck out in my mind uh, as sort of the gold standard in modern sports when you're looking at bringing in somebody that's that great into a unit where you've already got greatness and trying to uh, function as a coherent whole. They really, really did that in a strong kind of a way. And the starting pitching, for all intents and purposes, for a lot of people is the first thing you think of when you think of those teams during that period of time. Somewhere well down the list would be, of course, the bullpen, the closer from time to time, Mark Wallers uh, being a a guy that uh, comes to mind for having some momentary success anyways. Subsequently, John Smoltz later on getting into that role. But I'd like to get your thoughts on, as I was reading and preparing for this, uh, Jim Cott's theory that uh, the the team – Ultimately, had they had a little bit more consistent ninth inning success during that run of time, that might have been something that tipped the balance in their favor to win more than one World Series. I know there's a lot of popular theories out there about what might have done it. So I guess it's a two-part question. A, do you agree with him? And B, if not, what do you think might have been instrumental in bringing a little bit more uh, overall success during this time? I definitely do agree with Jim Cott. He's a good friend of mine. He's a good guy. and He really knows his stuff. And by the way, he should be in the Hall of Fame himself. Yes. Yeah, Todd is definitely right. The one weakness, the one Achilles heel that the Braves had almost throughout that streak, except when Smoltz was in the bullpen, was a lack of a quality closer. It's too bad that Craig Kimbrell didn't come along years earlier because that would have won a lot more pennants and a lot more World Series for the Braves. I mean, they had guys like Alejandro Pena, who lost the last game of the 1991 World Series. Then they used Charlie Liebrandt in relief a couple of times, and that didn't work out too well. And so the Braves always lacked that one great closer until Smoltz went to the bullpen. And that was really to preserve his elbow more than anything else. Well, that's an excellent point you make about uh, Kimbrell because it's kind of ironic that for a period of time there, and I don't know if you would say that that's still the case because right now there's a little more conjecture about who's the best closer in baseball. But there are a lot of people, myself included, who thought he really took the baton from Mariano Rivera when he hung him up. And, of course, Mariano Rivera being a big thorn in the side of the Braves with the two World Series there. So, yeah, Kimbrell uh, was uh, maybe the, the uh, right guy at the, at the wrong time as far as having some old, more overall success because, as you say, it could have been a tremendous impact on that. want to get some thoughts from you on uh, a new baseball book that you have coming up. But before we do that, just to kind of bring things full circle, the Braves franchise right now, what's very interesting is you look at the trough of the late 80s and uh, 1990, and again, a team that went worse to first in 91. It's not like anybody saw them coming. So there, there were, were not a lot of expectations for this thing when it happened. There weren't any expectations additionally for the Braves coming into this year, probably fairly minimal going into next year. Obviously, uh, again, everybody pointing to the new ballpark. There's been a whole sense of, well, why even try at this point in time? We're pointing to the new park. So as they're trying to replicate the success of the 90s, as they're going young, as they're trying to accrue a lot of talent, which interestingly enough is the same thing they did three or four years ago. I thought they might have had a core that might have won a World Series in the last couple of years. But aside from Freddie Freeman, most of those guys have been jettisoned. But as you start getting into the next couple of years, If anybody in the front office is reading this book or or even just kind of examining a history of the time that went by, what do you think are some of the things that are going to jump out at them as they're trying to put together another long run of success and things that the lessons that they can leverage? Well, I know that John Scherholz read the book because I got an email from him that said, I love the book so much that I gave it to my son, Jonathan, to read. So Scherholz is the president of the Braves. He's the boss of John Hart, who used to be the Indians, by the way and also the boss of John Coppolella, who's a 30-year-old rookie general manager who is over his head and has no idea what he's doing. And you can quote me. (laughs) I I am distressed at how they destroyed the Braves. I think they made numerous bad trades. Uh, I understand when they had to trade Hayward and they had to trade Justin Upton because their contracts were going to be up and they wanted to get prospects for those guys. But there was no reason in the world to trade people like Evan Gaddis or Alex Wood or Craig Kimbrell 
and Andrelton Simmons, to name those four, people that you would pay to see games, you pay to, to watch them, you buy a ticket to see those guys, they were young studs just coming into their own. And, in fact, Simmons, just to cite one example, he could be a Hall of Fame shortstop just on his defense, like Ozzy Smith. So I think the Braves made some very, very bad moves, and this couple other guy keeps stocking up on pitchers and pitchers and pitchers. They have no home run hitting in the minor leagues in the farm system, and until they strike a balance and get that offensive end, the Braves are going to be a very bad team for a very long time, and they're not going to draw in the ballpark. People go to see a team. They don't go to see a stadium. That's a very interesting perspective, Dan, because I have to say, from the outside, it didn't make a lot of sense to me either. But I'm always cognizant of the fact that I'm not there, I'm not on the ground. You know, maybe there's a little bit more than meets the eye. So what you're, what you're telling me is that for all of us nationally that we're kind of scratching our heads, but there was good reason to do so. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Very true. Okay. All right. Well, that uh, that, that is some interesting clarity. And, uh, again, uh, an organization that – hopefully uh, can start to learn and leverage and put in place these lessons in the next couple of years and get things turned around because they have a lot of fans down there who are very rabid, who definitely would love to see another winning era of baseball. But in the meantime, they have your great book to enjoy, to relive it all when the Braves ruled the diamond 14 flags over Atlanta. And I want to thank you very much for having us sent us a copy of that. It was a real pleasure to read. And of course, uh, again, for somebody that has written as much as you have over the years, uh, Dan, uh, a book like this is never the last chapter. There's always something else coming up, and I learned off air before we started here that uh, there's another project in the works. So uh, please describe that for us. I'm working on a book now called The New Baseball Bible, Notes and Nuggets from the National Pastime. It's going to be a 400-page, oversized, illustrated book that looks like the Old Farmer's Almanac with a baseball motif. And if anybody out there recalled my earlier book, The Baseball Catalog, which dates back to 1979, this is the 12th revision of that book excellent oh that'll really be something to look forward to for all the baseball fans out there uh, any kind of a uh, time frame on uh, when, when the book might be out or is that is it still a little early to tell well it's supposed to be out next march so let's hope we stick to that i've got to get it done first and i'm really pushing the deadline but we'll get it done oh just in time for next baseball season that's excellent that's something for everybody to look forward to and in the interim uh, again as we, as we said uh, an excellent book when the Braves ruled the diamond, 14 flags over Atlanta. Dan Schlossberg, it's been a real pleasure to uh, talk to you today about this book. Uh, please don't be a stranger. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you very much, Rick. And we should tell your listeners that Bobby Cox wrote the forward of the book. That's right. That's right. Looking at it right here on the cover. So uh, yeah, that is uh, an excellent uh, font of more insight for anybody who is looking to uh, learn about uh, the point of view that went into this and, of course, yours was impeccable being up close all those years. And for everybody who reads the book, they, they see the fruits of that and what you were able to extract from it. A true pleasure, sir. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you, Rick. My pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in today to FDH Lounge, mini episode number 734. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, all clear channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com. Com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 